Good morning, Hometown Church. Welcome to our Sunday morning service. We're very happy to have you. Hey, if you're new and watching us for the first time, I just want to say um, like a special welcome to you. We're so happy you decided to choose to watch our service, and we hope that you're really uh, refreshed by what you see and experience today. Uh, my name is Kate Stiglitz, and I'm from our New Hope campus. And I'm Mark Stiglitz. I'm the campus pastor up in New Hope. And Kate, I'm having a little bit of deja vu here because just a few weeks ago, I was here with Jake and we did the first ever father-son hosting combo for our church. That seems like a pretty big deal. Well, now we have the first ever daddy-daughter hosting combination. Wow. <laughs> I know, it's we're breaking all kinds of new ground here. So, you know, the bad thing though, I think mom might be getting a little bit nervous she probably thinks I'm going to ask her next to be doing this. We're kind of going through family members. so She would really hate that. <laughs> she would hate that, wouldn't she? Maybe she's not watching. We can hope, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, great to be doing this with you. And we are glad that you're here with us this morning. We're in the middle of a series called The Seven Principles of Emotional Health. And today, Brent Knox will be talking about something that I think is really relevant for us right now. You know, Kate, it's Christmas week. We're just a few days away from Christmas now. And it's the season of joy, it's the season of peace, but sometimes we don't feel the peace, right? Are there, are there times maybe where you don't feel the peace in your life that you think you should? Absolutely. Peace is one of those things that like, I know it's really important, but man, like choosing it day to day, it's like, it's a struggle. And like, I can for sure relate to like having anxiety about a lot of different things like my future and whatever. So yeah, peace is definitely needed right now. <laughs> Yeah, and I think a lot of us can feel the same way. And so if you relate to that at all, I think Brent's words are really going to speak to you today. So we're going to hear from him in just a few minutes. But before that, we're going to spend a little time worshiping the Lord with a few songs. Kate, you are in the band today, right? Yes, I am. All right. Well, how about if you go get set up so you can play and then I'll pray for the service. How's that? Sounds good. All right, great. Go ahead and get set up. And uh, how about if you guys join me and let's commit this time to the Lord. Uh, Father, we do just thank you so much that we can worship you today. We thank you that we can celebrate the birth of our Savior. What an incredible thing that is. And God, we just ask that you would bless this morning. God, I ask that you would take away any distractions that might be in our hearts right now. I pray that this time of worship would just be an encouragement to our hearts and it would be a blessing to you. I pray that Brent's words would just really challenge and encourage us today. So just use every part of this service for your glory, and we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. This first song we're gonna sing is, uh, it's one that some people might consider uh, a bit tired, but, but I'm not sick of it yet. Um, <laughs> And I think it, uh, it really paints such a beautiful picture of, uh, of our relationship with Christ. And it starts off, it says, He is jealous for me. Love is like a hurricane, and I am a tree, bending beneath the weight of His wind and mercy. He is pursuing us. He is all around us like a relentless storm. And he's tugging at us and we're, we're blowing in the breeze, we're bending, and we're still holding on to this dirt. And he's jealous for our hearts, he's jealous for our time and our attention. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory, when I realize how sweet his love is for us. And we're, we're taken by the storm and we're uprooted and, and all those stresses and all those things that we're holding on to, they're eclipsed by the weight of his glory, of his mercy. Let's sing this one together. He is jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When the 
all of the sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are And how great your affections are for me And oh, how he loves us so Oh, how he loves us By the grace in his eyes, if his grace is an ocean, we're all sinking. And meets earth like an unforeseen kiss, and my heart turns violently inside of my chest. And I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about.
ask you and I wanna be where you are. God, we thank you that you have made yourself available to us, God, that we can call, that we know you will answer. God, we thank you for your power. We thank you for your goodness, God. You have granted us freedom from our sin. His power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power in name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain. All sufficient sacrifice so freely given, such a price bought our redemption. Now heaven's gates swing wide. There is power in the name of Jesus. Break every chain, break every chain There is another in the fire Break every chain, break every chain There is another in the fire Break every chain, break every chain There is another in the fire Break every chain, break every chain There is another in the fire Break every chain, break every chain There is another in the fire Break every chain, break every chain There is another in the
full of change and trauma. From the pandemic to the election to riots and protests, this year has left many feeling emotionally exhausted. Join us as we dive into the writings of Paul from the book of Philippians and unpack seven principles for emotional health. About a month ago, I was terrorized by a woodpecker. Mary and I live in a split entry house built in 1969. It has rough cedar siding. And for whatever reason, a woodpecker got it in its cute little red head to peck on the west side of my house. Now I've had woodpecker trauma before. They peck right through the cedar siding right into the wall of my house. And, and a few years ago, a, a squirrel followed its lead, climbed the side of my house, entered a woodpecker hole, and began to live inside our walls. And from our bedroom, Mary and I could hear it rummaging around in the walls. I was not happy. Next day, I got my ladder to do some hole plugging, and I climbed about 20 feet up, got my face about one foot from the hole, and a squirrel popped out. He freaked, I freaked, he leapt right out of the hole, flew right past my ear and landed on the ground. And I was so startled that I jerked back on the ladder. I almost met my maker that day. That's why I have woodpecker PTSD. So a month ago, I'm sitting in my home office and I hear a rat-a-tat-tat, rat-a-tat-tat. And immediately I got anxious, I got upset. My blood pressure spiked. I, and I have enough going on in my life than to be terrorized by a demon woodpecker who's boring holes in the side of my house. And after a few stressful days of leaping from my chair, every time I heard a rat-a-tat-tat, I went in to pound the walls to scare them away. I'm walking into the kitchen, and I hear a rat-a-tat-tat right above my head. And I pound the ceiling with my hand and run outside. And just as I round the corner, a woodpecker is flying out from a newly formed hole that goes right into my attic. And again, I'm not happy. And my mind went wild. I kept imagining nesting woodpeckers in my attic, expelling waste products, breeding and dying and all sorts of other disgusting things. And, and so I went into full woodpecker mitigation mode. I hung cheap Christmas tinsel on the west side of my house. Evidently, the, the swaying, glistening tinsel spooks them. And it seems to be working. Praise Jesus. Now, this woodpecker has been a metaphor for me concerning the past three years. Hometown Church has had three straight years of anxiety. In 2018, we experienced a leadership crisis. Rat-a-tat-tat. In 2019, we implemented fundamental church changes, and most of us, we don't like change. It, it makes us feel anxious. 
rat-a-tat-tat. And then there was 2020, a year of relentless packing with the pandemic, racial issues, and the election issue that polarized not just the country, but the church, rat-a-tat-tat. I think we're all yearning for just some semblance of stability. I mean, can't something just not change just for a minute? Can life just be normal just for a minute? That's why there's so much anticipation for the vaccine, so we can just get back to normal, so we can get back to our normal anxieties. You know, the normal stuff that makes us Americans one of the most anxious countries in the world. You know, normal anxieties like jobs and kids and marriages and aging parents and overdrawn checking accounts and plumbing problems and woodpecker holes. Today we talk about worry. I know Paul tells us in Philippians, don't worry about anything. And yet he writes this in jail with a possible death hanging over him. And, and yet he writes, don't worry about anything. Paul is the epitome of emotional health. Now, this is the sixth week in our journey through the book of Philippians. We're isolating seven principles of emotional health from the letter of Paul. Each principle is related to joy. And the word joy or rejoice is used at least 16 times in Philippians. You know, scholars describe Philippians as the most joyful book in the Bible. Joy is actually commanded in the letter twice. Now, here are the two places. Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. And then secondly, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Now, the pursuit of joy is a command. It doesn't just happen to you. Joy must be pursued. It's an obligation not just a nice option. Do you remember that cheerful little song, Don't Worry, Be Happy by Bobby McFerrin? Well, Lisa and Spencer, they made it famous at hometown a few years back, and here's a piece of it. Ain't got no place to lay your head Somebody came and took your bed Don't worry, be happy the landlord say your rent is late He may have to litigate Don't worry Be happy Don't worry, be happy now do, 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 do. Now I cut it off just as you are getting into it I know you are, sorry But I have an issue with that song Paul didn't say Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, be happy. He said, whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice. Joy is commanded, not happiness. There is a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is achieved externally. Joy is achieved internally. We achieve happiness when we receive something like a gift or an award or an honor it's laughter at a funny joke or pleasure in accomplishing a goal we've worked hard for. We're happy when our loved ones surprise us or when our children or our grandchildren are born or, or when we enjoy time with friends or plunge ourselves into our hobbies and passions and all that's good. But what if all that's taken away or it doesn't happen? Joy is possible when all that is missing. Now, happiness is unsustainable while joy is sustainable. Happiness is an emotion that can end in an instant. Eventually, we stop laughing, but, but joy sustains and stabilizes our reactions, our ups and downs. Happiness is directed at self. Joy is selfless. Happiness can occur apart from Christ. For instance, you can feel happiness by drinking alcohol or watching a good movie. But on the other hand, joy is a fruit of the Spirit. It can't be obtained apart from a relationship with Jesus. That's the bottom line. Joy is rooted in the Lord. That's why Paul ends, in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. 
Always be full of joy in the Lord. All the emotional principles that we've been covering in this series lead to joy. And joy is the goal. A person who's full of joy in the Lord is emotionally healthy. And don't settle for anything less. Joy is one of the great marks of a person who is truly Jesus-centered. So today is principle number six, emotional health through pursuing peace. Because one of the greatest enemies of joy, of emotional health, is a lack of peace because of worry. So don't worry. Let's read. Don't worry about anything. And I'm going to stop right there. What's worry? Well, the English, the old English root from which we get our word worry means to strangle. Worry strangles you. Notice that this is a command. Don't worry. It's just like, don't lie, don't cheat, don't have sex outside of marriage. Don't worry. Now, this just might be the most often disobeyed command in America. You know, the new American Standard Bible version says it like this, be anxious for nothing. Now, actually, I'm pretty good at obeying this command. You know, Mary and I have joked about this often because this version, this was the first version that we read for our first Bibles. So, you know, there are days that I just feel anxious. I, I just feel worked up and agitated, and, and I don't know why. I, I just can't put my finger on why I feel anxious. It just seems like I'm anxious for nothing. So I tell Mary, well, at least I'm obeying Philippians 4, 6. I'm anxious for nothing. Uh, you get it? Anxious for nothing? Mm, never mind. Putting aside the bad joke, worry is a real issue. It strangles you. It chokes your spiritual and emotional life. That's why it's a command. God cares that you do not strangle yourself, so he says, don't worry. Don't worry is a command. It's not just a nice lifestyle option. But we treat worry as a nice option or even a personality trait. We say to ourselves, yeah, I, I wish I wouldn't worry, but, but you know everybody does. It's, it's just not possible not to worry. Besides, I'm a worry wart. That's just my personality. That's just who I am. Well, you know, that's a little like, yeah, I wish I wasn't a thief, but everybody steals something sometime or another. Besides stealing things, that's just me. That's just my personality. Stealing things, it's just me. Worry isn't a personality issue. It's a sin issue. But don't be discouraged by that because any command in the Bible is embedded with hope because God wouldn't issue a command if it weren't possible. A worry-free life is possible. It does, though, involve making different choices. There's an alternative lifestyle, and it's signaled by the word instead. We are to do something instead of worrying. What is it? Now, I hesitate to read any further here because if you've been around the Christian block for a while, this spiritual solution is so often talked about, so well known, that we're prone to disregard it because we think it doesn't work. What is it? All together now, pray and thank God. And we think, heard that, know that, been there, tried that, yeah, 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 pray and thank God. Everyone knows that, didn't work. I need a higher strength prescription. Well, there is a higher strength prescription implied in this passage. Don't worry by, number one, letting go of our illusion of control. Worry happens in our minds. That's where it occurs, right? It's when we run through all the possible outcomes of our dilemma and we try to figure out what we are gonna do in each and every outcome and our minds churn nonstop and we often go to the worst case scenarios like, you know, woodpeckers that end up roosting in my attic and then eliminating waste products and then piling up dead corpses, resort, resorting in rotting smell. Then what am I going to do? Here's what psychologists say about anxiety. When you feel 
internally out of control, you try and control the externals. Timothy Keller, pastor, author of Counterfeit Gods, describes a sign of caving into the illusion of control is anxiety. Anxiety becomes common. You know, the most anxious people I know are control freaks. And we're all control freaks to one degree or another. The truth is, is that we have very little power. We are so limited. You know, 95% of what sets the course of our lives is completely outside of our control. I mean, if you were born in Somalia, rather than in the United States, your life would be completely different right now. No matter how hard you worked or how well you used your talents, you would have ended up being poor and powerless. We have been shaped by things outside of our control, like circumstances that hit us or family life, genetics, intelligence, talents, all resulting in completely different outcomes. So how do we let go of our illusion of control? The passage says, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. This is way more than just sending up a few smoke signals to the Lord because we can pray and deep down inside, we still want control. How? By making demands through our prayers, by creating expectations through our prayers. Think about Paul here just for a minute. I mean, he was in jail, right? And I'm sure he and many people were praying for his release after all, he was already familiar with a couple supernatural jailbreaks. He knew about Peter's jailbreak in Acts 12, where evil King Herod Grippa threw Peter in jail. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. And what happened? An angel supernaturally came and broke him out of jail. But then Paul experienced his own supernatural jailbreak. Paul and Silas were falsely accused of creating a riot in Philippi, the very place where Paul was writing this letter. They, they were beaten and placed in stocks, and I'm sure Paul and Silas were praying like crazy for a jailbreak, just like Peter's. And while they were praying and singing to God, another supernatural jailbreak did occur. And don't you think this created an expectation for Paul, now that he's in jail again, that a jailbreak trifecta was in the works? Don't you think he could have been a little demanding here? Do it, Lord, do it, just like you did for Paul, just for, like you did for Peter, just like you did it in the past. But this time it didn't happen. Why? This time it wasn't God's will to release Paul from prison. We don't get to decide what's God's will. We don't get to control God by our prayers. We don't know what's best for us or what's best for his kingdom. We just don't know much. You know, we're like a little six-year-old who asks, Daddy, I want a smartphone. Daddy, Peter got a smartphone, so I should get one. You know, there's a will that supersedes our short-sighted requests. And the way we know we are letting go of our illusion of control, even in our prayers, is by our willingness to give thanks. Paul doesn't say, just pray. He says, pray with thanks. So you're worried about things. So you're concerned about things. Make your prayers with thanks. In other words, if you thank God as you are making the request, then you're saying, Lord, whatever you do in response to this request is good. I thank you for it. If I'm asking for something which is at the wrong time, you don't give it to me. I thank you for that. If you give me something that's just the opposite of what I ask, even though I know it's gonna be really, really hard, I thank you for that, that you're ordering my life in a loving way. It's then that God promises that you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. Peace only comes when we let go of our illusion of control. And maybe this is why America is such an anxious country. You know, studies show that richer countries have much higher rates of anxiety than poorer countries. 
Americans are seven times more likely to experience an anxiety disorder than Mexicans, even with their drug cartels. Why? Our money gives us an illusion of control. We think we can control life through our money. We think the more money we have, the more able we are to control outcomes. The more money that we have, the more secure we feel. But you know, it doesn't really work out that way. Evidently, it's just the opposite. Money doesn't solve anxiety. It only increases it because money fosters our illusion of control. When you feel internally out of control, you try and control the externals with money. Now, the second higher strength prescription implied in this passage is this. Don't worry by slowing down, not speeding up. Anxiety can only be solved by slowing down with God. Often, anxiety propels us in the opposite direction. We, we speed up so we can solve our anxiety. I mean, it makes sense, right? You know, solve whatever you are anxious about by doing more, work through all the possible scenarios in your mind, come up with a solution and get her done. And Paul is basically saying here, do the opposite of what your nature is telling you. Your puny little efforts won't change your life. Slow down to pray, give thanks, spend time with God. Listen, I'm like you. I make my to-do lists. My to-do lists are extensive. They're arranged in multiple columns and in a spiral notebook. In fact, I, I brought it with me and it's right here. Uh, I, you can see the, the multiple columns. And I know this is a pretty low tech, but just looking at this just, just makes me anxious because I'm reminded of all the stuff that I need to do even today after I'm done here. I, so the answer is obvious, right? Work harder, work longer, work faster, speed up. Does that list there represent my illusion of controlling my world or does it just represent being responsible and hardworking? You know, I think it all depends. It all depends whether or not Slowing down for God is the first on my to-do list. Slow down for God first. Pray with thanksgiving first. Then trust God to take care of whatever time you have left. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've approached my to-do list the other way around, that I want to finish my to-do list first, you know, so I can clear off the deck so I'm not anxious about all that stuff, then spend time with God without all that stuff hanging on me. Well, the time hardly ever came because I never got to the bottom of the to-do list. Again, there's a promise embedded here. It's a conditional promise. You know, there are a lot of promises in the Bible some of them are unconditional, meaning God promises us something in spite of what we do. But some promises are conditional, meaning that God prom promises us something if we do our part. He will do his part of the bargain if we do our part of the bargain. This is a conditional promise. If we pray and thank him, then we experience peace a peace which exceeds understanding. And the peace guards something. His peace will guard your hearts and minds. This word guard is a military word. It's a really vivid word in the Greek, evidently. It means to position army around a city to protect it from invasion. So if you've got an army out there, you sleep really well because you feel protected. It's like having a simply safe security system, but with guns. I like this guard imagery because things happen when you're cruising through life. You know, accidents, they happen. People you love get ripped out of your life. Jobs are lost and it makes you feel unprotected and vulnerable and you feel exposed. Yet the peace that God provides can make you feel protected. But it requires giving up control by praying and thanking 
by slowing down to be with God. Then there's more. Here's the next verse. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. This is an exhortation for a disciplined mind. You know, our minds are like toddlers. Have you ever been a parent of a toddler? Toddlers wander off all the time, constantly getting themselves into trouble. Our minds do the same thing. They're constantly wandering off into things that make us anxious. Therefore, just like the parent of a toddler, you need to be on constant alert. But there's more here than just positive thinking. There's more here than just a positive thinking technique. There's more here than replacing bad thoughts with good thoughts. I want you to look at the first three words here where it says, true, honorable, and right. Evidently, according to Timothy Keller, these are particular Greek words that are used in Paul's letters frequently that point to doctrine, that point to the truth about the gospel. In other words, what Paul is saying is, if you want peace, think about the good news. After all, what is more true or honorable or right than a God who is so pure that he cannot even look on evil. You know, his eyes are so different from our eyes. Our eyes are attracted to impurity. His eyes are not. He hates sin. It revolts him. There's going to be no hint of sin in his presence. What is more true or honorable than a God who is so in control of the universe that he deserves all honor forever and ever. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. I mean, even your knee will bow and your tongue will confess Jesus as Lord. And that day is coming. And what is more lovely and more admirable than a God who steps out of heaven and becomes a baby? What is more lovely and admirable than a God who comes our way and incarnates in bodily form right here on the planet Earth. And what is more lovely and admirable than Christmas, the visible demonstration of the humility of God? And who is more lovely and admirable than Jesus? No one. And what is more excellent and worthy of praise than the cross? That's where God's purity and his love were demonstrated at the same time. There's nothing like the cross. You know, at the cross, God's hate for sin was demonstrated by pouring out his judgment on the body of Jesus. And at the cross, God's love was demonstrated by giving his own son to receive that judgment. Is there anything more excellent and more worthy of praise than that? God only does excellent things. And he did so, so excellently that we got all that we needed to be forgiven so that we could stand in his presence without a single fault. You know, Jesus rescued us from the darkness of this world and is preparing a new heaven and a new earth and we're gonna live with him forever. Your future is secure no matter what happens. You're gonna get there. Remember what Paul said at the very beginning of Philippians? He said this, And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. If you've asked Jesus into your life, if you are actively counting on what he did for you on the cross, substituting for you, then... God has began a good work in you, and he will continue and finish his work. Paul is certain of that, and you should be too. You will be in his presence, blameless and with great joy. And this really is an example of an unconditional promise. And now listen, 
This is also the ultimate answer for anxiety. The most anxious thing anyone ever faces is, what happens to me the second after I die? You know, psychologists say that this anxiety is at the root of most of our anxiety. Irvin Yalom, a psychiatrist, claims that death anxiety underlines much of our human distress and casts a shadow over all our daily life. Other psychologists talk about how we must constantly deal with this inner stress, the basic desire to live, fighting against the certainty of death. This inner stress is a fountainhead of anxiety. But if you know the beauty of the good news, then the most anxious thing that you've ever faced and that you ever will face, the day of your death, has been solved. We will rise from the dead because Jesus rose from the dead. And this puts all our other anxieties in perspective. I mean, when you think about it, what's the worst thing that could ever happen to you? What's the worst outcome of all your anxieties? Well, you die. And that's not so bad because you're going to rise from the dead and God's work will be finished and you'll be in his presence without a single fault and with great joy. That's the ending of your story. And if you know the ending, then the anxiety is taken out of your story. I mean, for instance, if you pre-recorded a Vikings game to watch later, and, and in the meantime, you hear the final score before you watch, and they win, then the anxiety is taken away when you do watch the game. Even though the purple might be down in the fourth quarter, you just sit back and relax, and you say to yourself, somehow they're going to win. I'm just going to sit back and relax and watch how they do it. And in the end, you win. So just sit back and relax and see how God does it. But this will take a mind firmly fixed on the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, one last verse to sum up. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw in me doing then the God of peace will be with you. What's the promise? This is conditional. If you put into practice what you're learning, then the God of peace will be with you. What this means is actual application. What this means is that you just can't listen to a Sunday message like you're listening to right now or or just listen to a small group Bible study that you're a part of, and just by listening, expect your life to change. You have to do something. You have to react to what you've heard. You have to apply. This is why we end our messages with some type of application. And what is the application today? Application, don't worry. Number one, let go of your illusion of control. Pray, yeah, pray, pray your head off. But model your prayer after the Lord's prayer. Make your request like this, thy will be done. Isn't that an expression of submitting your prayers to the will of God? Since God's will is better than your will, then thank him for whatever the result of your prayer. And then number two, slow down, don't speed up. Anxiety is not solved by doing more and doing it faster. And you can only pray and cast burdens if you slow down and spend time with God. And then three, fix your mind on the good news. You got to preach to yourself. Tell yourself the truth. Like a strong parent, take control of your wandering toddler mind and preach good news to yourself. Don't let your toddler dictate terms. Then the peace of God, the God of peace, will be with you. That's a promise. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we commit this to you, and we are so happy today and so full of joy that you're a God who's in complete good control of our life. And for that reason, we just want to sit back and we're going to relax 
And we're going to see how you work it all out for our good until we reach the end when you finally finish what you began. We thank you for that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and ever pining till he appeared and the soul fell. The thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new glorious morn. Fall on the leaves. great to worship with you guys this morning. And I was really challenged by Brent's words today in this message. You know, I don't feel like I'm the kind of person who is a control freak, but boy, I resonated when he said that concept of the illusion of control, because I can see that in my own life. I just know that sometimes when things don't go my way, I can feel very anxious about it. And it's kind of because I don't have control of the situation. I, I know that's the case and I don't want to be that way. So, boy, that's just such a great challenge for me to think about something like that. I want to spend more time just being quiet before the Lord and slowing down with Him in prayer and thanksgiving. So, great, encouraging message today. Hey, I hope that you guys will join us this week for Christmas Eve. We are going to be having live services at all three of our campuses at 3 p.m. So if you are able to attend in Bloomington, Lakeville, or New Hope, we would love to have you join us live. And if you can't be there in person, we're going to have our online service 
also at three o'clock on Christmas Eve. And here's what I would suggest that you do. If three o'clock doesn't work for you, you can watch later at your convenience too. That's okay. You can watch anytime on demand later. So figure out what works best for your family and gather everybody and work it around that. So make that something that you do as part of your Christmas celebration. Gather the family, watch our online service together. You can get more information about that on our website, hometownchurch.com. You can find lots of other information there too, including how to support our church financially if you'd like to do that. So guys, I hope you have a wonderful Christmas week. I hope that we see you on Christmas Eve, either in person or online. And God bless. Have a great day.